Lord be with you. The stories found in scripture are incredibly rich and still so relevant today. And I love especially the stories of the Old Testament because they represent real people with real problems that, that resonate with many of us in our faith journeys. The stories of Israel remind us that no matter where we are in our journeys with God, we still have room for learning and growth, that we will spend the rest of our lives striving to become better, better Jesus followers, better in the workplace, better neighbors, better friends, and spouses, and parents. The stories of Israel remind us of how challenging this journey truly is. And some days we seem to do everything right, while on others we miss the mark. In these stories, we also meet our God, who is at times misunderstood and perhaps mischaracterized. Perhaps you've heard the so-called comparisons of God's nature between the Old and New Testaments. The OT God is supposed to be wrathful, whereas the NT God is gracious. The OT God runs a tight ship, whereas the NT God is more flexible and nurturing. But the truth about God's nature is that in both, we see a God that's more than anything consistent. And Jose reveals to us that in a moment when God is expected to be wrathful towards the people of Israel, God instead responds very compassionately. Jose 11 reveals the heart and mind of God more than any other passage in the Old Testament. In reading this poem, you may feel as though you're reading God's diary because it's so personal. In this passage, God recalls the numerous ways in which he has nurtured Israel, yet his efforts have largely gone unnoticed hardly appreciated. And God recalls loving Israel like children, yet the more God does for them, the more they seem to turn away. And here we see God processing this, it's something that we rarely get to see in Scripture. This poem in Jose, by the force of prophetic imagination, takes us inside the troubled interiority of God. It does not, however, start there. It begins rather with an external encounter between God and Israel. The poetry is cast in the imagery of father-son, with God cast as father and Israel cast as son. And it could as well have been cast as mother-daughter. But the imagery of father-son was operative in Israelite imagination since God's first declaration, Israel is my firstborn son, in Exodus 4. And status as firstborn son carries with it immense entitlement, but also inescapable responsibility to uphold the honor of the father and the family. And the father reviews with and for the son the long history of their relationship with an accent on the generous, tender care that the Father has shown toward the Son. An Old Testament scholar, Walter Brueggemann, suggests that in a patriarchal society, this Father has exhibited amazingly tender attentiveness toward the Son. And their relationship begins in Egypt with the emancipation from slavery. But from that first act, the son, like a two-year-old, has been wayward and refused the father by acting out of other loyalties. The father, nonetheless, has been patient and kind. He taught the little child to walk. He carried the little child in his arms and attended to every fall, every scar, every wound, every fear. The father supported the little child 
with embraces of love and held him close, but stooped low to attend to him and fed him. The father has guarded the son when the son was vulnerable. And the cadence of the passage shifts in verse 5. And now apparently the vulnerable child has become an unruly teenager. And the teenager bursting beyond defenselessness has refused the attentions of the father. And he has done so by seeking military alliances with the Assyrians. And more tragically with Egypt, the very source of initial slavery. And Hosea alludes to the 8th century BCE policies of northern Israel when the government in Samaria entered into alliances that in Hosea's purview violated the covenant with Yahweh. And as a result, Israelite society is devoured by militarism. And that disastrous policy leads to the verdict of verse 7, my people, that is my firstborn son, is resolved to reject me. And thus the conclusion echoes the initial judgment of verse 2. The child rejects the life-giving relationship with the parent. And we can imagine that verses 5 through 7 are a shrill rant, the kind a teenager can evoke from even the most caring parent. The parent is completely exhausted with the child and is willing to leave the child to the consequences of his headstrong choices. Israel is abandoned to its self-destruction, the kind in which teenagers may find themselves when parents act in tough love. But then in verse 8, there begins a wholly different rhetoric in the form of a divine monologue. It is as though God has finished with that external relationship and has no will to be the parent. Now God turns inward in a moment of acute, critical reflection. And this is unique, because in both popular religion and in stern orthodoxy, God is not said to have any unresolved interior life. But here the poet gives us access to divine self-critical reflection. The move from oracle verses 1 through 7 to monologue verses 8 through 11 is as though the father, in the middle of a rant, catches himself up short, as though to say to oneself, what are you doing? It's as though this father comes to himself as the son came to himself in the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. Only now it is the father who comes to self-critical reflection. The father comes to recognize that the one against whom he rants is his well-beloved firstborn child. And as a result, the father asks himself four probing questions that are in exact parallel. How can I give up, hand you over, treat you like Sodom or Adma? like Gomorrah or Zeboiim. It is though God recognizes the unacceptable conduct of treating his well-beloved child in such a harsh, rejecting way. And these are serious probes on God's part as the father sees that his actions toward his child are not really what he wants to do. And so God chooses a path of graciousness the chapter highlights a parental love that stresses other dimensions of the God-Israel relationship in relation to the marital love metaphor described in chapters 1 through 3. And this love is instructive. It teaches a child how to become a better person and to strive for the common good. It's a tolerant and patient love that allows a child to make mistakes and accepts that child back in forgiveness. It's an unconditional love in spite of the child's rebelliousness, a corrective love 
that intervenes when a child strays too far off the path, and a healing love that helps bring a wayward child to wholeness. And after recalling Israel's offenses, God makes it clear that he will not respond wrathfully. And in reading this passage, I couldn't help but recall the moments when my siblings and I exhibited wayward child behaviors, ones that we were held accountable for, but not exactly punished for. There were times when we messed up so terribly that we just knew the wrath of our parents was on its way, but by the grace of God, it didn't come. I can recall an incident when, that occurred when my brother and I were teenagers we were playing croquet in his bedroom just minutes before we were to leave for a week-long trip to San Antonio. My brother hit the ball, and it went flying through the window. And our dad came rushing in after hearing the sound of shattering glass. And he looked up at the broken window and very quietly, with no expression on his face, left the room. He returned with tape, and he taped up the window, and... Then we left for San Antonio. But that was the longest ride of our lives <laughs> because we waited in agony for our parents to tell us how they were going to punish us. But they never did. And after all these years, I still can't believe it. <laughs> but I can recall countless discoveries of carefully buried Brussels sprouts and English peas and Flintstone vitamins found in the depths of the kitchen trash can. We injured ourselves doing senseless things. One summer, my brother broke his collarbone playing tackle football with no pads, while I broke my wrist after falling off of a monumental cannon at the CB base. We were old enough to know better. Another summer, we both injured ourselves just two weeks apart. There are other incidents that I won't recall because I don't want you to think less of me. <laughs> but I'll just say that we didn't make life simple for our parents. And yet in moments when we felt we deserved to be dealt the punishment of all punishments, they responded with so much grace. And I'm grateful for the moments when they did choose to discipline us because we needed it. But the times I appreciate and remember most vividly are the times when we were prepared for the worst, but received grace instead. Has there ever been a time in your life when you were prepared for the worst after some mistake you made, but instead received grace and compassion you see, there are times when we all could use some grace, something that we all need but aren't entitled to. It's a gift, a beautiful gift that our Heavenly Father has blessed us with, a gift that we must also share with those who've disappointed us. And often it's easier said than done. In Hosea 11, we see even God struggling to process how a group of people he loved and nurtured so deeply could do so much to offend him. How could they do this after all that I've done? And perhaps you've asked that same question before. There are times when offering grace is difficult, when compassion and understanding seem unattainable, when we've been hurt and offended. But the life, death, and the resurrection of Christ reminds us that if God can forgive his children, it's always possible for us. It may take a journey, months, perhaps even years, but with God, it is indeed achievable. As we celebrate God's grace, we must be mindful of the fact that God continues to call us to a higher standard. Colossians 3 reminds us that grace does not exempt us from pursuing righteous lives. 
God's grace doesn't give us permission to be reckless in our habits and destructive with our words. Because we have new life in Christ, God calls us to pursue new ways of living, rising above bad habits that keep us distant from the Father. Because we have a resurrected reality, we are to seek the things from above that entails seeking conduct that reflects our resurrected life in Christ, who sits in the position of power and status at God's right hand. The things on earth are detailed as immoral behavior, which includes anger, abusive language, and sexual immorality, and evil desire, and idolatry. And because we experience a death to our old reality in baptism, we are now called upon to put such conduct to death. And by God's grace, we are empowered to pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off to become the best versions of ourselves. And also by that same grace that dwells in each of us, we've been called to empower others to do the same. What a blessing it is knowing that someone forgave you for a mistake you made. And what a blessing it is for someone else to know that you chose to forgive them. There truly is something about God's grace. And we can be rest assured, my brothers and sisters, that God's grace is indeed sufficient for each and every one of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.